others. Okay, so um, on the surface, William Shakespeare's fictional character, Hamlet, and I have nothing in common. He is an 18-year-old prince mourning the loss of his father and the quick remarriage of his father, of his mother, to his father's brother. I am a slightly older than 18 years old English teacher, just slightly, whose parents are still married and who studies Hamlet's story with my classes. But it occurred to me this past year, as I was reading the play for about the millionth time, that Hamlet and I, although incredibly dissimilar, do share something in common. Both of us love art, to be around it, to participate in it, and to create it. Shakespeare himself said, the object of art is to give life a shape. But sometimes art just isn't enough. Tragically, Hamlet's life was shaped more by pain than by creation. I don't actually remember studying Hamlet when I was in high school, although I know I must have. In fact, I don't remember much about my classes in high school at all. The only ones I can conjure are my art classes, painting, jewelry making, pottery, drawing. I wasn't a good student. I sat in the back of every class, head down, drawing or writing in my journal. At the end of my senior year, I wrote an essay for the final exam in English. My teacher called my house the next day. She told my mom that I was a terrific writer. She showed my essay to her husband, who was a college professor. He was also amazed that a high schooler could write like that. And then she apologized for not noticing. But it was a little too late. For most of my high school years, I skated at the edges of your typical teenage breakdown. Writing helped. Art, art class helped. I wasn't very good at art, <laughs> but my poetry was sappy, and my poetry was sappy and overwrought. But I liked creating stuff. I liked being immersed in art, and the whole process, start to finish, brainstorming, drafting, revising, publishing. When my art was displayed on the wall, I felt a rush. There was a little smidge of me in that painting, and when people validated it, when they complimented it, a little bit of the pain that had been trapped inside of me my 16-year-old self and was now held within the four corners of my art became something meaningful. Beauty was inspired by pain. It wasn't until much later when I was charged with the task of teaching Hamlet to a class of 20-something high school kids that I suddenly felt a kinship with him. Long gone were my angsty teen years I had stumbled my way through them using visual art and creative writing as therapy. And I was happily teaching in a school that allowed me ample room to nurture my own talents and interests. But here was my old pal, Hamlet, a young man, the quintessential emo kid, I tell my students. And I just learned the word emo a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> thank you. Who yearned to be heard. His soliloquies spoken alone on stage, his sensitive, thoughtful nature, his interest in dramatic arts all speak to his desire to have an audience who will pay attention to his pain and allow him the space to feel it, to create from it, and to unpack it from his heart. So, Hamlet. Let's stop and consider him for a moment. Consider the implications of teaching his story to a class full of bright, articulate students who would be his peers if we all went to the same school, Wittenberg. Hamlet is the same age as many of my students. Hamlet endures incredible emotional distress. So do many of my students. Hamlet doesn't know how to deal with that distress and turns to his friends and family, only to have his true feelings ignored. To cope, he composes gorgeous poetry, but it's about suicide and death. Nobody listens. As we unravel Hamlet's story in class, it's clear that we could be talking about any of the teenagers in there. Any teenager, really, who feels alone, misunderstood, and desperate. So how do we keep the howling, how do we help the howling emotion of adolescence become something magical? You know, inspiration, it's a funny thing. Um, it doesn't always come gift wrapped in the form of a muse. Sometimes the best art is inspired by the worst pain. 
So for Hamlet, his greatest work came from his greatest pain. For those of you who don't know the play, it goes something like this. This is the abridged version, by the way. There's not enough time to do the whole thing. OK, so uh, Hamlet's dad, King Hamlet, he's been dead two months from mysterious circumstances. And he returns as an angry ghost, hell-bent on revenge. You can tell who the king is by his crown. <laughs> Unless if, if my art wasn't speaking for itself. OK, so then uh, Hamlet's father inspires great emotion in him. And the prince vows to exact his revenge upon the new king, his uncle Claudius. All right, that is pretty good, right? OK. <laughs> Uh, Hamlet's understandably angry with his mother for marrying her brother-in-law so quickly. Uh, that anger transfers to his girlfriend, Ophelia. Hamlet has a number of amazing, eloquent, angst-filled soliloquies that nobody but us get to hear, debating the worth of his life and contemplating suicide. He is both a poet and an actor. Instead of being inspired to use his talents to create, Hamlet is inspired by Fortinbras, his literary foil, an aggressive, impulsive young man who leads an army to certain death over a small postage stamp sized piece of meaningless land. An AP student in my class recently asked why we, as readers, see Hamlet's lack of physical aggression in the play as a bad thing. We talk a lot about his inability to act, which roughly translates into his inability to kill. I thought about that student's question. Why do we fault Hamlet for his sensitivity, his thoughtfulness, his reluctance to commit a heinous crime, even if it is justifiable? And why does Hamlet fault himself? In his soliloquies, he calls himself some pretty harsh names for being only able to talk about his pain instead of act upon it. Well, things only go downhill from there. So in pain over his mother's role in the affair, Hamlet accidentally stabs the king's advisor and Ophelia's dad, his girlfriend, you remember, uh, Polonius, thinking it was his uncle. And Ophelia, distraught over her father's death and Hamlet's betrayal, has a breakdown and commits suicide. Hamlet's upset and engages in a fight with her brother Laertes in the grave, in Ophelia's grave, no less. So the problem for Hamlet, as I see it, nobody was there for him. His beautiful soliloquies were all spoken into air. His friends were all spying on him or lacked understanding. His mother was occupied with her new husband. He was alone. His pain inspired him to create. But when nobody was there to listen, his pain took a sharp turn and inspired him to destroy. So in the end, everybody dies. It is, after all, called the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. There's the body count. So Hamlet knew he was going to his grave. He was offered a chance to refuse. There's special providence in the fall of a sparrow, Hamlet tells his friend Horatio, right before going to his certain death. His earlier assertion that he does not set his life at a pin's fee resonates loud and clear. He doesn't care if he lived or died. So what if Hamlet talked about his pain? What if when he talked about it, people listened and heard what he was saying and validated those feelings? Hamlet's tragedy may have ended very differently. So let's go back into the play and rewrite what could have been. Hamlet is upset at his father's death and his mother's marriage. Instead of a soliloquy on stage, however, he publicly reads a slam poem at Java Jive about his pain at the urging of his creative writing teacher and inspired by poets they are studying in class who are also emotionally distressed like him. The poem is scrawled in his journal as the winds howl through the castle eaves, is awash in your typical teenage angst and fear and anger, and is directed towards his mother. The poem is written in the style of Sylvia Plath, a fellow tortured poet. It might go something like this. 
Mommy, mommy, you do not do, you do not do anymore, Queen Gertrude. Call me into your boudoir at night when I should be tucked in bed, my head a messed up murderous stew with thoughts bubbling of the king and you. Mommy, I wanted to kill you, but my father, the ghost, wants your soul to roast and orders me sheathe my dagger away. But mommy, mommy, you will pay. I should be adrift in a dream of Ophelia's kiss my sweet, fragile miss, some reverie of bliss, not wondering what you and uncle might be plucking between the reachy sheets. The funeral meats furnished your o'erhasty wedding, and now I'm shedding my grief like scales. Mommy, your wails are music to my poisoned ear, and I could never talk to you. I've always been scared of you with your airs and your crown and your corsets of silk and your sour, royal mommy milk. Mommy, you bit my pretty red heart in two, cleft yours in twain, you say, your piteous eyes like two dark styes, and in them I see your dark, dark soul. Mommy, below lurks an old mole who wants you to repent, swear on his sword that he's your true lord, embrace his belief, and give up that false king to his patches and rags, acknowledge this grief, my heart is steeped in sorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Mommy, I'll have my due. There's a knife in your fat black heart and a poisonous pearl in your throat like a dart. Mommy, Mommy, you ripped us apart and all the king's subjects never liked you. Mommy, Mommy, you traitor. I'm through. I'm not done yet. So I'm willing to bet that at the end of Hamlet's slam, the audience would snap its fingers and clap and hoot and Hamlet would feel the pride of creation and at the same time the realization that a smidge of his anger towards mom and his own perceived failures was now contained in those words, those words that he had unpacked and set loose from his heart. And he would realize that the more he writes his words out into the universe, the less anger there will be to fester inside of him. I believe the answer then to saving our students and our schools lies as Shakespeare knew in the arts, in nurturing strong arts programs in high school, which is exactly the thing that we're all urged to move away from. Students need to be able to channel their pain into creation, and as family and friends and teachers and administrators, we are charged with that task, allowing them the spaces to channel that pain to inspire creation instead of destruction. I could not be here on this stage without my family and my friends and my professors in college who inspired me to read my work to an audience, to send my poetry to magazines, and to write and draw using my own inner turmoil as a medium. So maybe after Hamlet read his poem at Java Jive, he joined a rock group. <laughs> this is actually a real rock group called Scattered Hamlet. And he jammed at Grow as rock with his favorite band, Macbeth, which is also a real rock group. Uh, maybe then the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, would be the happy story of Hamlet, poet laureate of Denmark, or actor of Denmark, or rock star of Denmark. The possibilities would be endless. And because he was able to release his art into the welcoming world and celebrate his gifts, he would, as I do, have a life shaped by art and hope and love. <laughs>